Hello, and welcome everyone to the pinnacle, I think, of this week's event, um, Fireside Chat uh, between myself, Anya Kamenetz, I'm a reporter for NPR, and the man of the hour, Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State University. Hi, Michael. How hey. are you? Hey, Anya. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of the people in this community like to talk about disruption, but I think 2020 has given us all a run for our money. Um, can you give me an update on Arizona State's operations right now, both on the campus and then around the world? Well, you know, Anya, we've decided uh, uh, way back in January when we had our first positive case uh, within our community that, uh, in fact, even before that, in December, when we heard about the virus breaking out in China, we activated our emergency preparedness group. Uh, we started thinking about how to deal with a global pandemic. And while it's been challenging and difficult and uh, very, very complicated, uh, we decided from the outset that uh, the only way to advance uh, in these kinds of moments of disruption is to accept the disruption and begin managing against the disruption and begin managing and adjusting in every way that you possibly can. So I won't walk you through everything, but you know we've been putting a lot of time and energy into new systems, new learning systems, new technologies, new testing technologies that we built from scratch, uh, saliva-based testing systems, new health check apps, new ways of training our faculty. Uh, we Zoomized, uh, put Zoom technology into a thousand classrooms, allowing anyone to come in and out of a classroom on a moment's notice. So here we are uh, in the first uh, month and a half of our fall semester, 74,000 students here in our full immersion learning environment, uh, hybrid operations, some class being offered, classes being offered on Zoom, some being offered in a face-to-face -face distributed uh, and dispersed modality, other classes being offered in an online mode. And then, by the way, we also have an online set of activities that we have, which has the highest enrollment that we've ever had. So we have about 140,000 or so students uh, this semester. Long story short is, uh, you know, we're learning how to move forward. We do a daily health check. Uh, I did mine this morning, got the green light, which meant uh, I could come to campus. I didn't have to have a test today. Uh, and so uh, the truth of it is that this disruption from the virus is something that we're going to have to prepare for across many dimensions uh, going forward. And so uh, what we found is that uh, if, you can, if you can have a great faculty like we do and you have a great staff like we do and you have technology options and you're willing to learn and you're willing to adjust and you're willing to make things happen, you can pretty much adjust your way through things. And so we're up and operational. We have thousands of research groups that are fully functional, uh, more than 200 of which are active in COVID-related things. And so so we're far from where we were in February uh, 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 earlier this year, but we're uh, fully operational and fully functional. The past six months have been called the biggest distance learning experiment in history, not only for higher ed, but for K-12. And what, has, what experience have you brought to this pivot? Um, and how has it uh, changed your previous thinking about the affordances of distance learning and as well as the benefits of the in-person experience. You know, I don't really know what this distance learning word is, but we are, we're a teaching, learning, and discovery enterprise. Uh, we have ways in which we facilitate that in a full immersion face-to-face -face mode, which we have done as a species for forever. Uh, we've got ways in which we've enhanced that on our campuses with unbelievable technological augmentations. And now when we find ourselves in a mode where we need more freedom of choice in terms of who can be with us and how you can move back and forth. What we've done is we found a way to project the university and our learning environment into uh, various settings, into your home or your apartment, uh, uh, into uh, other settings. Uh, and so distance learning, this is still learning. We're still immersed with each other right here. I'm talking to you. We're thousands of miles apart. Thousands of people are, are, are watching what we're, we're doing, coming in from all kinds of settings imaginable. This is not distance learning. This is human interaction assisted by technology. Distance learning might be what we call ASU online where we're not synchronous. And so what we have now is, and in fact, since, since uh, March, we now realize that we have three teaching and learning modalities. We have full immersion technology assisted learning. And the reason I keep emphasizing the technology assist is that it turns out that we can enhance learning, speed learning, uh, get greater learning outcomes by assisting the fully immersive learning with technology. We have uh, full immersion 
synchronous learning, uh, what we call ASU Sync, what we're doing right now. I taught last semester and the second half of the semester involved using uh, Zoom technology. We got some of the best outcomes. I've taught that same class for almost 30 years at Columbia University and at ASU. We got tremendous learning outcomes, tremendous student products out of the class that I taught. And then we have ASU Online, which is asynchronous, where you can show up whenever you want. All three of those are now fully functional. And it means now, rather than dropping out of college because your mom is sick, you could go spend time with your mom when she's sick and still go to class. Uh, and so it requires a faculty that's open-minded, which ours is. It requires a faculty which is technologically uh, uh, enhanced, which ours is, and a faculty which is trained and supported by fantastic staff, which ours is. And so what we found is that now we've taken the university teaching and learning environment and we're able to project it almost anywhere, anytime, any scale, whatever's needed by the, by the learner or by the student. What about the social and emotional relationship aspects of learning? How do you cultivate those across the various modalities? So for a late adolescent emerging adult who's 17 to 25 years old, uh, you know, while the brain is still plastic and the brain is still being formed, if you can find a way to be involved in a full immersion, face-to-face, technology-enhanced learning environment, you should do that. Everyone can't do that. Some people can do that. And so that is a fantastic environment. If you decide when you're 18 to serve your country and you join the Navy, uh, and then you find yourself on, a, on an aircraft carrier off the coast of Afghanistan, uh, then you might have to then have another learning environment that you can become engaged in. And then in that environment, the social interaction that you have in the military is affecting you, but also we have to create a social way of enhancing learning through this technology format that we have. If you're an adult and you didn't finish college or you didn't have a chance to go to college, uh, and you're engaged with us on, in the sync mode, ASU sync, or you're engaged with us in the ASU online mode, we can create differentiated emotional uh, 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 learning environments in addition to your technical learning environments. But in that case, in general, you're already older, you're already more mature, you're already more developed as a person. Uh, and, and so uh, we think that we have to find a way to operate in all of those environments. We're not trying to diminish diminish the central thing about going to college. In fact, we have 75,000 students here with us going to college, involved in thousands of groups and activities and tens of thousands of interactions. So what we've tried to do technologically, even in the Zoom mode, is to facilitate all of those also. And so what we're trying to do is to capture as much of this human interaction, emotional development also, in addition to the more formal learning activities that we uh, facilitate. What do you mean capture it? Well, we're trying to facilitate it. So, so for instance, in the Zoom that we're using, we are using hundreds of millions of minutes uh, a month of, of Zoom technology. And it's not just for classes. Every student group, every student study group, every student work group, uh, every student club, uh, every personal interaction that people have going on, you know, let's study together, let's work together, uh, all being enabled by uh, Zoom technology, work groups, creative groups, design groups, uh, in fact, the things that I saw at the end of last semester and the things that I saw at the end of summer school were some of the most fantastic work products I ever imagined, and they were all done by groups working in this modality. Wonderful. Um, so in the midst of all of this, you published a book. Um, it's titled The Fifth Wave, and that's a reference, I think, to the, the evolution of the university as an institution. What is a fifth wave university? So the U.S. is this fantastic uh, beacon of democratic uh, idealism uh, that, uh, you know, the first large, uh, successful, constitutionally based democracy. Uh, and then we have developed four previous waves of colleges and universities. The first wave were basically British ideas of colleges formed in the United States, Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, uh, Penn, Yale, schools like that. We call those the colonial colleges or America's Greek academies. Hundreds of those have evolved over time. Uh, Bowdoin College in the late 18th century, Bennington College in the early 20th century, for instance. And those, those uh, small liberal arts focused, completely immersive colleges is, are one form of America's colleges and universities, as I said, a couple hundred. In the Southern states, they didn't build these private religious schools. Harvard was a religious school. Columbia was a religious school on founding. So the state in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia started these Greek academies on their own. From that then, public colleges emerged, uh, public universities emerged, teachers' colleges emerged in the 19th century, community colleges emerged in this second wave. 
uh, in, the, in the 20th century. The third wave was a truly unique American idea, the land-grant universities, Illinois, California, Michigan State, Purdue, Iowa State, uh, Texas A&M, schools like this, fantastic American idealism at work, you know, teaching and learning for the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics, which at the time meant working class people. There's 55 or so of those out there that are doing fantastically. And then a series of 1890 historically black colleges and universities that were added to the land grants, fantastic institutions. The fourth wave, another unique American invention was the combining of the German Technical Institute with the British College into an American research university, the first of which was Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University in 1876 in Baltimore. Uh, Stanford and Chicago followed. Uh, and then after those three private institutions got going, a bunch of the colonial colleges became research universities, Columbia, Harvard, Princeton. A bunch of state colleges became research universities uh, like Michigan. And then a bunch of land grant schools like California and Purdue, Texas A&M became research universities. And then the fifth wave, sorry for the long uh, prelude here. The fifth wave is another uh, American manifestation of democratic idealism, which is the emergence of a scalable, technologically enhanced, socially purposed institution, in an institution which has the heart and the beating heart and the beating and the, and the breathing lungs and the mind of all of the previous waves of universities, but is now devoted to social outcomes, to social success, to economic success as its measurement of success at scale. And so the fifth wave is now the emergence of discovery-oriented and research-oriented universities uh, that are devoted to then as their purpose, uh, society's transformation and society's success. And ASU, I would say, is, is the first prototype followed by others of this fifth wave uh, type of university or college. The history that you just outlined is in American history. And you started it with a statement about American, America speaking of democracy to the world. Um, we are living through a year in which, in a global pandemic, with 4% of the US, of the world population, we have 20% of the casualties from this terrible disease. And there are many in the world who are wondering about the status of America continuing to lead culturally, economically, scientifically. Um, with your thesis about the university and this is one of the standard bearers of America at its greatest, uh, how are you going to be as a leader uh, trying to continue America's historical position and I guess recover what we seem to be losing? Well, what's interesting, Anya, and I'll, I'll take a little bit of the question uh, from more of a political perspective, a political design perspective. So the more liberal democratic democracies in the world, uh, England uh, as a part of the United Kingdom, France, Belgium, Spain, Italy, the United States, and several others have had dramatic uh, complexity managing this virus because they're built on very, very extreme levels of liberty. Uh, and uh, highly decentralized decision-making. So in the United States, we have 15,000 plus school districts, 3,000 with elected school boards, each calling their own shots. And so our democracy is not one that's, that's organized well to deal with a fast moving global pandemic where you need everybody to act together and in lockstep in, in ways that are uh, simple to communicate and easy to implement. Nothing has ever worked that way in the United States. This democracy is built around the notion of argument. It's built around the notion of debate. And so what we haven't done yet is that we, we haven't matured our institutions, including our universities, to give us better theories about how to maintain democratic principles while at the same time defending ourselves against a heartless uh, virus which uh, has already killed you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, in the United States and is likely to kill many more until we can get our act together. So one of the things that I do at the university and one of the things I do here is I say to ourselves, you know, we're the group of people in our society blessed with the opportunity to step back and take a look at how do we make better decisions? How do we use science to better inform our democratic decision making? How do we help people to understand what I call intergenerational liberty? Libertarianism and liberty is not just the individual protecting their rights. It's also protecting the rights of everyone and the liberties of everyone. One person's liberty can't deny or reduce the liberty of another person. And, 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 and in these kinds of moments, we don't have the right tools. We don't have the right thinking. 
But then even at the root of it, we, we have a society which is, is uh, overly ignorant. Uh, they, they, they don't yet understand the complexities of the world. They don't yet understand the, the full meaning of a global pandemic and the, and the way that you defeat something like this. And so I think all of us in the, and I'm using the word liberal, not in the political sense, but liberal in the design sense of the emergence uh, in, in the, uh, after the Renaissance and in the enlightenment of liberal democracies where individuals have rights. And so where individuals have the most rights around the world, we've had difficulty managing this virus. And we need to figure that out. We need new political theories. We need new scientific teaching. We need new ways to understand how to make high-speed decisions. We need to make decisions on how to uh, take care of each other. Uh, all these things are places where we're weaker than we should be. And we need to step back and take, take a serious look at these things. A different answer than maybe you, you thought you might get, but... Uh... No, not at all. I think that's, um, I mean, I guess the question is who's going to take the lead on that effort because uh, American institutions have been at the center of the university enterprise globally for a long time. And um, do you think that we can stay that way? Well, I think who's going to take the lead. So one of the things that we're trying to do as a university is to say when you approach this from a scientific perspective, and you uh, use the masking technology, which is highly effective. Uh, you use uh, random testing intensively, which is highly effective. You uh, use health checks, which are highly effective, guiding people to uh, 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 stay away from work or school if they're inf infected with anything. And then towards testing, if you basically take a, a scientific management approach to a virus, your institution can function, your society can function through the virus. And then you make adjustments as you are more or less successful in managing the virus. And you make those, you make those uh, adjustments on an instantaneous basis. Everybody understands the what and the why. And so it's about the rationality of approaches here. There's no emotionality to a virus. A virus is, is not even a living organism in the way that you think about a living, breathing organism. It's a, it's a packet of RNA in this particular case that's looking for a place to reproduce. Uh, and it has some kind of function that we don't really understand. That means then that there is no emotionality to this. It is raw, rational, scientific management. And what we need to do is to understand when we have to go in that mode, not reducing the liberty of our citizens. And universities can demonstrate this. And our ASU and others are attempting to demonstrate how to operate in that modality. So you're leading by example, in other words. Short answer, yes. Trying to. Trying to. Knock on the fake wood that's here on the table in front of me. Um, what are some of the emerging technologies uh, beyond the medical, but, but in the learning sciences that have you the most interested and hopeful uh, that are on the horizon? Well, one of the things that we've really worked toward is uh, that right now there's a whole series of urban myths. I almost think of them as uh, urban lies. And so uh, because they've been perpetuated as lies. And that is that your family income and your family status will determine your educational achievement level. False that somehow people can't be taught mathematics, that uh, they, they can't understand it, false. That somehow science is uninter uninteresting or not teachable and that we have this, uh, you know, that only Singapore and Shanghai and other parts of the world have these high achieving math outcomes and somehow Americans are just stupid. Uh, and so all of those things are false. And they're, they're, I won't go through the reasons that such things are perpetuated, but what we found is that uh, using uh, advanced learning techniques, advanced learning technologies, learning systems, augmented intelligence, uh, uh, adaptive learning systems, and so forth, we can change learning outcomes across the entire society. We run many uh, charter K through 12 full immersion schools. We run a digital high school. We run uh, uh, an immersion university. We run an online uh, set of uh, uh, courses across all of those hundreds of thousands of learners and we study learning outcomes and what we realize is that the urban myths about educational achievement should actually be called urban lies everyone can be move, can move forward everyone can graduate from high school everyone can graduate from high school everyone has an opportunity to have a fully fulfilled opportunity to learn what you need to learn to be an effective uh, member of our of our democracy and our economy in the 21st century and then on top of that, what I can say is that even in the middle of this uh, pandemic, we've doubled down, tripled down, and quadrupled down on our own technology investments. We did a deal with Dreamscape Immersive, a Los Angeles-based uh, uh, 
technology and storytelling company of the highest order led by uh, uh, its founder, Walter Parks, and, and other creative forces like Steven Spielberg. Uh, I've spoken to both of them recently about where we're going and how you can use full immersive avatar-based learning to change learning outcomes at scale. We're underway. We'll have the first unbelievable learning experience ready in February for people to, to travel to an alien zoo on a uh, uh, orbiting a planet uh, uh, 50 light years away. Uh, they'll be able to be a scientist in a fully immersive environment, but they won't be learning fake science. They'll be learning real biology, real chemistry, real physics, real math, all these things together. So what we see is just this huge opportunity for technology to enhance learning. Um, it seems like we're really going to need it because right when your book was coming out in April, nine out of 10 of the world's children were out of school for the first time in history since we've had formal schooling. There's never been a disruption like this. And by the time we get back to normal on any timeline anyone is foreseeing, some of those children will have been out of school or been inadequately educated for 18 months or maybe two years. Uh, as a leader in the field of education and someone who's always tried to expand access, how do you even think about the magnitude of that challenge as a society that we face? Well, Anya, it seems exciting to me. I, I, lo I love the challenge. And so what we have to do is we have to take and, and update our 19th century model of education, which is a small little room with a teacher at the front of the room and a bunch of desks nailed to the floor. Uh, and, a, and some kind of board that you're writing on. And, and I, I know we've made a lot of progress since that, but what we need to do is we have to, we have to begin to realize that learning is a lifelong process. We're gonna have periods of formal learning with teachers and, 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 and co-learners that we're working with. We're gonna have moments in which we're gonna be immersed in technology-based learning, and then we're gonna be immersed in human-centric interactive learning. We're gonna have combinations of those two things together. We've got to throw off the, the shackles that constrain the way that we think learning must be carried out and realize that all of these approaches and all of these methods are gonna be required at the same time. Then when we have disruptions, either to the individual, to the family, to the community, no problem. When we have larger things like global pandemics, no problem, we'll work our way through this. Uh, certainly, uh, I think one of the things I think that has a lot of people afraid, uh, teachers, faculty members, professors, and others is that somehow when I talk about all these things, I'm interested in replacing something. The teacher's at the core of everything. The professor's at the core of everything. What I'm talking about is augmenting everything, augmenting the learning process, augmenting the learner so that they can better understand the teacher, better interact with the teacher. And so what I'm, uh, what I'm interested in is broadening learning outcomes away from the few people that are uh, able to be enhanced by the present learning methodologies that we have, which are very limited very limiting also. And do you foresee uh, a better, more harmonious effort among all the different stakeholders in society to pull forward to make this happen? And you sort of alluded to a tension between perhaps the tr traditional educational system and innovators, but in the face of this challenge, do you think that, that people can move forward together? Well, I think they can if they start changing the metrics of success. We need to stop thinking about you know uh, a college uh, that is uh, really good because it doesn't admit anybody that applies. Uh, and so that's not a measurement of anything other than uh, how many seats they have and how many applicants they have. It's a great measure of their market success. It's not necessarily a great uh, uh, measure of their social success. And so what I'd like to see is colleges, universities, and schools measured for the success of their individual students, what happened to the students that came, but then also what, what impact did they have on the broader society? Uh, and so I'm all for changing the measurement of the, of the success of public universities. Do you have, uh, do you have uh, economic growth that's accelerating? Do you have social uh, 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 equity that's uh, being enhanced in terms of access? Do you, have, do you have social mobility where people are moving up between the social classes? Uh, do you have uh, uh, environmental outcomes and other things that are representative of what the people actually want? And what are the universities doing that uh, in, 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 in ways to contribute to that? What are colleges doing that are in ways to contribute that to that? Does everyone graduate from high school? And this makes a lot of people upset when I say this. If people, if everyone's not graduating from high school, and I could say comma eventually, period, uh, because there's you know lots of life disruptions that occur along the way and lots of issues that occur along the way, then we are basically failing. And we need to overcome the notion of the acceptance of failure. 
You can't move forward in the 21st century unless you're educated in the modern economy. You have to be educated to be able to participate in the modern economy and in the modern democracy uh, and in the modern world where you're facing things like the global pandemic. Uh, uh, otherwise, you're just going to blow with the wind and, and you might get a good outcome, but you probably won't. And so, and so what we need is we need a recognition of a need to enhance learning outcomes, not to do away with what we've done in the past, but to enhance them. Um, with just a few minutes left here, what is your message to the folks that are gathered listening to this? This is the education technology community. They've had a year unlike any other, um, but they may be wondering what lies ahead and, and where is their sense of mission to be found? What's your message to them? I got several parts to the message. So the, the pandemic is just uh, another realization of what a complicated planet that we live on is, and we can expect all kinds of disruptions going ahead. So let's just go ahead and embrace the notion that we have to be ready for these disruptions. We have to be ready to uh, be adaptive. Uh, we have to be ready to uh, continue the education mission, uh, regardless of what comes our way, number one. Number two, uh, we need more innovation, faster innovation. We need to change the clock speed of of education, we move too slowly. There's schools all over the United States that basically haven't done much in sen since March, in the sense that, you know, they're they're hoping that this goes away. They're hoping they're hoping that there's a vaccine, and so so I'm hoping that they've developed new systems to reach families that may be disrupted for years, uh, and, and that we've found ways to uh, uh, make our schools healthier and and to enhance our learning outcomes. So the notion there is prepare for and be resilient resilient toward disruption, but also in accelerate and enhance all thinking relative to innovation. And so that's my hope of, of what we can have coming out of all this. And so uh, both of those things are very difficult, though. They're very challenging because it requires you to even look at yourself and think through what you can do differently and how you can do things better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so... Yeah, so there's a level uh, internally, I think that's right, that we're all going through. And I wonder if you could share the strategies that you use um, kind of as a leader to keep yourself on task and also to keep the people that you work with um, engaged and, and dealing with the stresses of this situation. Well, I, I know we only have a little bit of time left, but it's kind of like the Groundhog Day movie. So, so Bill Murray's character had an opportunity every day to actually become a better person. So you just think about every single day producing a better outcome, producing a better result, just hard at it, hard at it, hard at it, criticizing yourself, uh, enhancing how you make decisions, enhancing what you're doing, and then realizing that you just get this one shot. So